Okay, I just clicked on go live and it's buffering now. All right. Okay. It's ready. All right. And so start up at any time, Stacy. Yes, go ahead and start. All right, sounds good. So, well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you to Stacy here at the Augusta Public Library for contacting me. Uh, my name is Jed Cork. I am the Augusta Forester Ranger with the Wisconsin DNR. Uh, basically, working out of Augusta here. So. I can't see everyone that's out there, but um, I'm sure there's some folks that are locally here and there's probably some other folks around the state maybe, or even the nation that are tuning in. So, so welcome and thanks for taking the time. A Little bit about myself, um, my job here as the forester ranger, um, it's pretty varied, which I really like. So I do everything from the education, um, outreach efforts and pre fire prevention efforts. And then if we do have fires, I do the fire suppression efforts, lead that. I also do prescribed burning. One of the cool things I get to do is also a lot of forest management, both on public lands and on private lands and private landowners' properties. I do some prescribed burning and then also some law enforcement. So my job's really varied, which I think is one of the, the neat parts of it. And I guess just a little bit of background. I actually grew up between Osseo and Augusta here. Uh, went to UW-Stevens Point to college. Worked in Minnesota for a couple years and then was lucky enough to get a job in Barnes, Wisconsin in Southern Bayfield County. I was so excited to work for the agency. I said, absolutely, I'll take the job. And I, one thing I, I think is still funny is the lady that offered me the job and I accepted to, I asked her where Barnes, Wisconsin was. And she said, I really don't have any idea where that is. So I took a job. I wasn't even sure where it was, but um, for four years, I got to work up in the northern part of the state. Uh, fantastic folks, uh, fire departments there. Kind of learned the initial parts of my craft, and then I had the ability and chance to move here to Augusta, essentially, in 2010, and uh, jumped on it, and I've been here ever since. So hopefully it's just a little bit of background on me anyway. So I guess I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint. Hopefully everyone's able to see that, and we'll kind of get rolling from there. And I guess just as background... Uh, I'm shooting to have probably about a 45 to 50 minute presentation for you guys to cover kind of a range of topics that are related to wildfires, uh, prescribed burning and native ecosystems, kind of very high level stuff, but I want to cover a lot of different things for you. And, um, you know, I can be a resource down the road if you guys want to contact me or maybe it'll uh, just give you a, a reason to look into these topics a little bit more. And I do have two videos towards the end here that uh, you'll get to see, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some good questions. So without any more ado here, we'll get started. All right. So like I said, I'm gonna cover a little bit about our wildfire history and tools and then some of the firewise principles so uh, kind of the second half here hopefully the first half will give you some background in the second half what i'm going to chat about um, kind of pertains to you guys um, whether you live in a rural landscape you live in the woods um, if you have a cabin on a property somewhere uh, or if you even visit some of those areas you know wildfire can be a risk basically anywhere so hopefully there's going to be some good takeaways especially in this video here that uh, maybe make you make some changes on your property if need be. So the first thing I thought is I'd show up a definition of what is a forest fire. And kind of the textbook definition is any uncontrolled, and that's the key word, fire consuming vegetation, whether it started intentionally or by accident, that's burning in grass, shrub, brush, marsh, forest, pasture, or rangeland. And I guess with that definition, you know, most folks picture a forest fire being in a forest, and it is sometimes, but really it's, it's what's burning, as long as it's out of control, it's considered a forest fire. So on the news, on the media, you hear people talk about grass fire, brush fire, bush fire, forest fire. It's basically all the same thing. So think of it that way, same as forest fire and wildfire, basically the same. 
And I just wanted to throw a plug in here. You guys can see the map here on the screen. Um, basically, wherever you live, recreate or visit. You know, if you're going to do any open burning at all of vegetation, uh, anything at all, I encourage you to talk to your local uh, municipality and especially your fire departments to determine what the burning rules and regulations are there. There's great information on the DNR's website as well. And the map that you see there, basically the area is in orange. That's the DNR's intensive burning area. So in those areas, we have uh, uh, basically a burn permit system set up. Those areas are most at risk based on the soils and the vegetation that's there for larger or large scale forest fires. Um, so that's why we regulate the burning there anytime that the ground's not snow covered. And there's similar, but a little varied uh, restrictions on the areas in yellow you see. And anything in white on that map, we consider the co-op area. So the DNR does not have any jurisdiction over the burning rules and regulations there. That would fall to the local municipalities or the fire departments. Uh, and I just wanted to show a quick video here. So I'm gonna show this and then a few pictures next. This video is of a prescribed burn uh, northeast of Augusta, about five, six miles here that we did last November. And as you can see, there's a nice line around this fire. And it was done basically going against the wind and done hopefully safely. And it was safely. If it will play. All right, I'm sorry about that. It didn't play, but my point was basically we started the fire and we burned it um, in a very safe manner. Uh, based on the vegetation that we had, the fire day that we had, and the winds. However, kind of the opposite of that here is some pictures from some uncontrolled wildfires. Um, you can see, obviously, a fire that, you know, we can't control. We got to worry about people's lives, evacuations, protecting houses. Um, and then, in, unfortunately, in the case here to the right, the picture on the far right side, that is a picture of a, a hunting cabin that was lost just east of Augusta here a few weeks ago, unfortunately, from uh, someone burning a debris pile, escaped, and the wind uh, basically took that fire and burned down a family hunting cabin, so very unfortunate. One thing I just wanted to show, I guess just kind of as we talk through and walk through things here, just for a little bit of background, some folks uh, maybe are aware of this, but you can see a picture of the map, and this is based on uh, original survey notes. This is based on soils, um, the vegetation that's there now, and several other things. But if you look at the map here of Wisconsin, anything you see that's basically yellow um, or yellowish in color, that is something that was dominated by fire or wildfire in the past. So that was all before pre-settlement, before people, for the most part, were settled here. So those areas continually burned on different scales and different levels. Um, anything basically in yellow there is, is a prairie of some kind. So it's either a oak barrens, it may be a jack pine barrens, a oak savanna, um, tall grass prairie, something similar to that. So the fire would burn across there and keep regenerating that cover type there. As time would go on, the areas that are more green, typically overall those have heavier soils. So a different uh, forest structure and component. They were not as dominated or regulated by the, the fires that would come through naturally. However, those areas too, as well, did burn at different times. Just the, the fire that came through basically helped regenerate and keep those habitats going in those areas in yellow on the screen there that you see. So um, kind of interesting if you pick out wherever you guys are here in the state, um, in Eau Claire County here, if you can make that out, for the most part, Eau Claire County was treeless or had very few trees. So a lot of what you see now, you know, we see forests on knobs along uh, the roads, the streams, that kind of a thing. There was probably some oak and, and a few pine in some locations, but overall you could see a long ways. This was a grass area and those fires burned. And naturally those fires burned from lightning for the most part, but also the uh, indigenous, indigenous folks and the Native Americans did do burning on their own. And that was to regenerate either uh, forest crops, uh, plants, or even things that they had in their gardens and to attract wildlife. So kind of that combination, that's where our fires typically regenerated from. So the one thing I just wanted to touch on for sure for you guys is a little bit about the um, fire and its use here 
and its part in the Wisconsin's ecosystem. So I like this quote here. I believe it is from our agency, and I think it kind of summarizes things really well. It says, prescribed fire is the intentional application of fire to a specific pre-planned area under specific environmental conditions to accomplish planned land management objectives. Without the use of prescribed burning as a management tool, Wisconsin could lose many of its native grassland, wetland, and savanna plant communities. So I think that summarizes things really well. That's why we prescribe burn. That's why we still put fire in the landscape because it is that important. Pictures you see here in the top right, that's a, a native bur oak tree. I consider that a wolfy bur oak. At one time that was probably sitting on a, out in the middle of a prairie or on the uh, fence line long ago. Uh, on the bottom middle, you can see jack pine forest, uh, very native here. Uh, I'll talk about that here in just a second. But uh, a natural tree on a lot of these soils that we have here, especially in Eau Claire County. And then the bottom left, you can see just a good example of a, a native prairie uh, with a lot of forbs or wildflowers. And really that prescribed fire, you know, simulates a natural process. So it's a natural and necessary component of the ecosystems like native prairies, our oak communities, our wetlands, and uh, a lot of the pine forests we have. And periodic fire is required to regenerate uh, and grow those fire adapted species as I've touched on, as well as maintaining the diversity and health of that whole system. So overall, Wisconsin has and continues though to lose our fire adapted ecosystems and the special species that are in each of those. You know, obviously we came here, we started to settle the land. I'll touch on it here, but you know, we had the great cutover, cut a lot of trees down or cut most of them. And that's had an effect um, basically as the population has grown, you know, building roads, all those things and farming. So. Some examples of some species that need fire are jack pine, all of our oak species, uh, those native prairies, forbs and grasses out there. And then kind of tangentially, you know, sometimes you don't think about the unique wildlife, uh, birds, insects, even those invertebrates that, that live there in the soil or on that soil, that those guys can't exist if we don't have those native ecosystems here. And the prescribed burns that we do, um, I think Wisconsin DNR probably does the largest acreage in Wisconsin, but fire department members do a bunch, uh, private landowners, and there's a lot of wonderful uh, private organizations out there. Just for example, the Prairie Enthusiasts and uh, uh, consultant contractors that actually do this stuff professionally. And they really are the ones that are keeping the landscape the way it is and helping to promote a lot of those species. And really many of Wisconsin's native plants developed adaptations to live and grow with the, those wildfires. So prairie grasses and uh, wildflowers, for example, have really deep roots that let them get deep down uh, and grab water even during dry periods. And really those root nodules are, are under the soil. So when they are burned, it stimulates fresh growth. So that's actually helping to enhance those plants. And after a while, anyone that's had a native prairie it's hard for anything else to get growing in there, including trees, because that root system and that that just ecosystem in the soil is so lush and, and so strong. Oak trees, for instance, have really thick bark, so it's adapted to a stand fire. So, you know, they're very fire tolerant. And then many of the pine species uh, rely on fire for regeneration through either resprouting, uh, fire activated seeds or serotonous cones. And jack pine, for example, a lot of the jack pine trees, not all, but most, um, some won't regenerate unless we have a fire. So you gotta have enough heat and BTUs essentially uh, to open those cones, drop that seed down on that black mineral soil to regenerate the species. And without that on our landscape, that's one of the reasons we're losing jack pine. And conversely, basically those invasive species and those fire intolerant plants, uh, they succumb to the heat uh, and also that soil moisture that's not there in the fire following the fire. Um, and also by removing the leaf and debris and litter on the surface and top killing those in that invasive brush, that fire stimulates the growth of native plants and maintains those habitats and soils. So um, you can still see remnants if you drive along, you know, most of the roads in Wisconsin, you know, there are still a few plants sitting there in that seed bank. And if we can just give them an opportunity and a chance to flourish, they can. So fire is a really good tool to make that happen. And really in the absence of fire, uh, the structure and species composition of a plant community changes and the removal of the fire favors, fire intolerant shade loving species. And those can crowd out those fire dependent species and creates ideal environments for especially invasive species. 
A uh, very common one around here being buckthorn and honeysuckle. So maintaining the integrity of the fire adapted plant communities is really crucial, especially in some of those critically rare ecosystems. Like I mentioned, the pine and the oak barrens, oak savannas and uh, a variety of the grassland ecosystems. And I guess just one good example is most of the oak woods here throughout Wisconsin, but definitely in locality here, Clark, Eau Claire, Chippewa counties, a lot of our oak woodlands are mature to over mature or beyond. And without fire on the landscape, we haven't had a chance to really regenerate those trees. Of course, deer play a role in that among other factors, but that's allowing basically mapleization, as I call it, to take place. So instead of regenerating that oak to get another generation of them, we're losing it. Those red maple are seeding into all of these stands, uh, basically filling them in with uh, red maple trees so that oak really doesn't have a chance to regenerate and it's dying out. So if you do see any clear cuts or similar you know, shelter woods and, and a lot of our oak species around here or oak uh, stands, that's what we're trying to do is regenerate it basically partially due to the lack of fire that we have. So just thought that was worth mentioning there. Uh, thought I'd put a few cool pictures here. Everyone's probably somewhat familiar with the kind of the Wisconsin great cutover. Um, the wood basically from the Northern half of Wisconsin, give or take really is what helped build Milwaukee and Chicago and even some of those other cities, Cincinnati and St. Louis. Those buildings, those structures, those initial towns, a lot of that wood and lumber came from Northern Wisconsin. So starting in the mid 1800s, all the way through the early 1900s, essentially for the most part, everything was hacked off and logged off and sent down rivers um, or on trains, eventually, you know, was milled and, and helped create all those cities. In the process of doing that, uh, you know, we, we tried to farm a lot of those lands. It wasn't designed or doesn't grow well for, for farms and forest product or um, ag products. So that land's kind of converted over time back to the forest that we have here in Northern Wisconsin. And I guess the closest to us, anyone that's familiar basically with the Fairchild area and North and East of there, there was some amazing white pine that was there that was originally cut off and by all accounts, three, four foot diameter, you know, well over a hundred feet tall. So we had some of those amazing, uh, amazing trees right here in our back door. And then in the middle down here, you can see there's a quick image. I wanted to mention the Great Peshtigo fire. Anyone that's familiar with that, probably the one of the largest and the, by far the most devastating wildfire in North American history that's known. Happened on October 8th, 1871 as a result of basically people clearing land and, and just burning piles of, of uh, brush to clear the land for agriculture. Fire, you can see basically jumped over the Door County, into the Door County Peninsula over Green Bay and did burn up into Michigan. And of course that was a long time ago. We don't know exactly how many folks died, but the accounts run from 1400 to 2200 people perished in that fire. And some of it was so intense that uh, even the railroad tracks melted. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. And that again was one of the effects of the great cutover. So kind of switching gears, a few other topics I wanted to touch on here. Um, this one here is basically fire weather and fire danger. So, you know, how do we determine it and kind of what are the factors that go in there? So you guys have all seen the smoky bear signs out there um, on the landscape. We got great partners we work with to change those. A lot of times that's fire departments, um, of course the DNR and other folks. And basically our fire danger changes based on the season. And the spring is our main fire season here in Wisconsin. So anytime that snow leaves or basically when our snow is melting all the way till about Memorial Day in Wisconsin, that's go time. That's our, our main fire season. Uh, we do get fires throughout the summer and then the fall is typically kind of a secondary season, but the spring is our, our most critical time. And then even within the spring, I'd say the second half of the spring is definitely more uh, uh, ferocious than the first half. The potential to burn a lot of our pine trees. So you hear about crown fires, fires that run through the, the crowns of the trees, the fuel moistures in there are reduced enough that enough heat can get there and carry that fire. So we have a surface fire and we can have a, a fire basically running through the crowns of the trees. So pretty much that's what's coming up in front of all of us here, starting right about now or in the very near future. So it's really important and critical to be, be safe with fire. 
Besides seasonality, you know, we're looking at the temperatures, relative humidity, uh, the days since we've had precipitation, our fuel moisture. So our one hour fuels are basically grasses, real small diameter stuff in brush. 10 hour fuels are up to a quarter inch or a little bigger. And then as fuel gets bigger, it takes longer to wet and also longer to dry out. So if we get in long periods where we don't have any uh, good moisture, those larger fuels start drying out. So then we're starting to deal with logs and stumps that are burning where earlier we may not have had to deal with those things. And we look at observed behavior. The one thing I want to mention is number four on your screen here is the wind speed. And here in Wisconsin, that is the number one driver of our fires. So with everything else is important, but nothing's more important than the wind speed. I mean, it tells us the direction it's going and that's really gonna help regulate the speed. And then on, down in the bottom here, you know, you can see some of the tools that we got that I'll touch on in a minute. Just wanted to throw a, a plug in here for Smokey Bear. Um, you guys all know who he is. So we deal a lot with uh, folks that are illegally burning. Sometimes they don't know it um, for the most part. Sometimes a few people don't care, I guess, but um, you know, if you're asked to put a fire out or if you have a campfire, no matter what, you know, how do you know when your fire is actually out, you know, and try to prevent that wildfire. So again, pour water on it, stir it with a shovel, pour water on it again, stir it up. And, you know, depending on size, it's going to depend how much stirring and water you need. But really, uh, the fire's not out until it's cold. Or as I like to tell people, you know, if you can't put your hand on or in it, it's still too hot to leave. So, you don't have enough of that that tools on hand that water on hand you got to go get more because we find a lot of our fires here in wisconsin are a result of holdovers sometimes a day a week even a month later um, and i did have a fire that um, was i think 28 days here several years ago uh southeast of osseo a landowner cleaned out his outdoor wood boiler he had about a gallon gallon and a half of ashes he poured them on a foot of snow we got a ton more snow in probably in March, I want to say it was. And essentially the fire escaped 28 days later. Even though that, that ash was insulated with snow, it still was able to maintain enough heat inside those ashes. And 28 days later it escaped, got out there in his uh, oak trees and you know nearly burned his house down. So you know that's why I want to make sure everything is out cold. Couple stats there. You can see people unfortunately start 90% of wildfires. Again, most of them are by accident, but that's just the way that that is. And for better or worse, if you do everything right, but you still start a wildfire um, in Wisconsin, at least in the DNR's protection area, you still got to pay for all of the fire suppression costs. I thought I'd throw in a real quick one here, just a couple statistics. So Last year, nationally in 2020, we had about 57,500 wildfires and they burned about 10 million acres in the United States. Um, that's a lot of land. And that was, I don't know if that was all time records, but it's its pretty much up there. Something else I thought was interesting for our fire department partners um, is we had a structure fire in this country about every single minute all year last year. So just kind of an interesting fact. And then last year in Wisconsin, we had about 800 forest fires that burned 1,650 acres. So about two acres or two football fields per fire, which was uh, both very low numbers compared to our normals. Uh, in 2021, as you can see this year so far, we've already had 363 wildfires that burned basically that same acreage. So as you guys know, our spring has been much drier this year. We had a lot less snow through most of the state. Um, and in some cases, even those those grasses weren't matted down and knocked down. All that stuff plays a factor here into the spring. So our fires, as you can see, based on numbers, have just had a chance to get up, get growing, and we're just having more of them. So that's just kind of what's going on. And then in Augusta, locally here, this is already essentially in the last five weeks here, we've had 12 fires that have burned 34 acres. And unfortunately, we lost that one hunting cabin I showed you. But through the great efforts, um, working with our fire department partners, so far we've saved, I think, three structures. So, and those are mostly cabins or uh, houses from folks had. And you can see the causes below, and they're kind of typical statewide, but we've had fires from debris burning, people that were doing a prescribed burner on their property on a bad day, wind took it, fire escaped. Uh, we had a vehicle or, or a piece of equipment that probably was blowing carbon on a very dry day. So those itty bitty chunks of carbon fell down into the grasses along the road, started 
fires, uh, people improperly disposing of ashes. We had a power line fire, and then we did have uh, also arson. So unfortunately there's a small percentage, but there are people that start fires on purpose still. Those are the most common causes. And one thing I thought I'd throw in here too is, you know, a lot of times you hear folks say it must have been a cigarette or it was along the road, it had to have been a cigarette or it was a cigarette. Truth be told, we have, you know, only a couple fires each year are started from cigarettes or cigars in Wisconsin. Sometimes it's attributed a little more to that, but really it's, it's tough to get a cigarette to start a fire. I don't encourage anyone to go try that though. So <laughs> take that for what it's worth. So a couple of tools that we got in our toolbox here. Again, I think I have a really cool job, um, basically as the lead for that fire suppression. So the page goes out, fire department, DNR are notified. We have a fire you know, in the woods, it's heading towards a house. I kind of love the, the, I mean, there's adrenaline to it, but I like the planning, the logistical thinking of it in route, getting on scene, you know, based on what tools do we got and how can we deploy them, you know, to be efficient and effective and do the most good. So like I show here, the, the tools that we got is some fantastic volunteer fire departments, which are top notch around here, well-trained, make a huge difference. You know, we have our staff and resources, the US Forest Service, I think another resource, National Weather Service. So for us, you know, they're, they're really giving us a lot of that fire weather information we need each day. Uh, you can see towards the top here in the middle, that would be our DNR heavy unit. So that's a type four truck that holds about 800 gallons of water, boatload of tools and hose. So we can make hose lays off that if we need. And then they, they pull our tractor plows out to a fire. And you can see one in the very bottom middle down there. And in Wisconsin, essentially we have good road system and good access. We can get our tractor plows to most of our fires drop down and they can put a plow or using their blade, they can put in a soil break around the fire to basically stop the fire at one spot. When you get up to the mountains and in some other areas, you know that you just, it's infeasible to use that equipment or you can't even get it. That's where you see the firefighters using hand tools um, to put in the, basically that same line there. And you can see, speaking of hand tools, we do use hand tools here and put in line using those um, depending on circumstance. We also have uh, spotter aircraft, which fly around, basically keep tabs on things, look for smokes and fires for us. In the top right picture here, you can see a seat, which is a single engine air tanker. They carry about 800 gallons of water mixed with a foam or a gel and they can, or retardant, and they can help uh, drop that. So we can direct where that is, maybe to protect the house a structure, um, cool down a flank so our tractor plows can operate um, or a number of other reasons. The bottom right in some of our wet areas, we use marsh masters or low ground equipment. So those can put in what's called like a mash line. They can kind of mat the materials down into the water. You can also spray water off those or do some scraping in some instances. And then of course, Smokey Bear as well. He is a tool in the toolbox, I'd say. So a couple more slides here before I get to the video I wanted to show you guys, but um, forest fires and structure protection. So any wildfire in Wisconsin can, you know, lead us to have to have a need here to protect the structure. Um, so basically when, when we hear a page or a call, you know, a fire can be a quarter acre, two tenths of an acre in a ditch even. And depending on circumstance, that fire can easily grow and threaten a house, dozens of homes or even worse. So it doesn't matter the size of the fire if it's near a structure. Obviously, we can have structures that are threatened. Um, locally here, we haven't had a quote unquote large fire, luckily, in, in a few decades. And I'm talking a fire in the thousands of acres um, that typically can or will burn dozens or even hundreds of homes. But we have the cover type for that, and it is going to happen. So it's kind of a, a preparation game on our end and then also education on our end as well to make sure folks you know, and I appreciate you guys being here tonight, become more aware of it and the things that you can actually do and control. And one of the things we do do is large scale exercises, which you can see on here, we're gonna do another one next year, south of Black River Falls. So we're gonna simulate a maybe five or 10,000 acre fire, work with our fire department partners and others, and basically run this as a drill, a dry run. So when the real McCoy happens, we're trained up. And I guess one thing just to remember, no matter where you live out there, 
don't always expect that a fire department is going to be able to protect your house. They sure as heck will try. We will sure try. Um, if yours is the only structure of maybe one or two and we have the time, we can definitely do that. But in an instance, in some cases here, we may have 20 or 30 houses that we need to protect. Uh, we only have 20 or 30 minutes to do it. With limited resources, we're going to have to pick and choose where we go. So uh, the video I'll touch on in a few minutes will really talk a lot about that. But just keep that in mind, I guess. And I just want to show these two couple slides here quick. If you're familiar, the German Road fire that happened in my old stomping grounds up in Southern Bayfield, Southern Douglas County, eight years ago this May. It was a 7,500 acre fire that you can see burned 104 structures. 23 of those 104 were residences. So those are people's houses. Some of the other ones that were lost would have been garages, barns or outbuildings. I think the takeaway for this was 350 structures were saved by the heroic and fantastic uh, fire departments that we work with. So they were the ones out there protecting everything that they could, planning out ahead of that fire. And a few details you can read on the screen there about the fire. It started about mid-afternoon, purely by chance, an accident by a piece of logging equipment. Fire got up and ran, and within minutes, the fire was up in the crowns of the trees, and it was just gone, out of control. And here's just a picture. Part of that fire was a surface fire, so it was burning on the ground um, over the surface. Flame heights varied from five to 25 feet from what I recall. I mean, it was ultra intense and it was flying. It was really fast. But you can also see the top left picture here is a crown fire. So those flames are hard to read, but they're probably around a hundred foot tall. And it's just consuming all that vegetation, just purely wind driven. When you look at the weather, obviously it was hot, it was pretty dry, but again, the winds are the biggest factor, 12 to 21 miles an hour. And on something like that, we can't really get out in front of that to try to stop it. So our number one jobs are life. So we're gonna to try to evacuate people. And if that's all we can do, we're, we're doing the best we can. If we have the time and the materials, we will certainly then um, look at property. So that's protecting our houses. So when we're at the end of a driveway, we have to make a snap decision. We're gonna definitely protect the house versus protecting a garage or a barn, something like that, if it comes down to it. And then the resource. So in this case, fire departments for the most part were out in front trying to protect the structures they could. Law enforcement and fire departments are evacuating people. I know just for instance, one of the game wardens that woke a lady up, basically just picked her up and threw her in his truck. Basically as the back half of her house was about to start on fire. She did lose her house, but saved her life. And our DNR resources, we were just piling them in on the flanks of this fire to eventually corral it. And then here's an example here, the Cottonville fire, eight years before that, uh, was the last large fire before. And again, a 3,400 acre fire, the fire got up and was just cranking and running. And it, again, it was started by accident by folks, hundreds and hundreds of fire department and DNR resources on it. You can see, unfortunately, we did lose nine residences, 21 cabins, and 60 plus outbuildings. But again, the majority of all those structures were saved, um, thanks in large part to the fire departments and good pre planned efforts. And just a couple pictures again from that, that day. Obviously, if we see weather like this, which we've had already and are going to have here as the spring goes on 75 degrees, 18% humidity, and again, really strong winds. You guys wake up in the morning and you see the weatherman talking about that kind of stuff or you hear that on the radio or if you're even a volunteer firefighter boy tuck that in the back of your head that makes for a really good or bad fire day depending how you're looking at it so um, i just wanted to basically show you through those fires we have fires of large scale we can have them here right here in eau claire county and anywhere throughout the state in a lot of places so just be cognizant of of that so I guess leading to the last few points here before I show a video is, so what can you guys as a landowner or property owner do to protect your home or your cabin from a wildfire? So basically we look at people's homes and cabins for better or worse as fuel because that's what they are in a wildfire. Uh, from there, we work with individual landowners and communities to try to make them safer. So. Just like what I'm doing tonight, hopefully this, this gives you a little inkling, a little background anyway, and gives you the encouragement to, to look more into this. Maybe you're thinking of your friends, your neighbors, your relatives' properties, 
And it'll get you thinking about it and, and learning some of those things you can do to protect it so you're not a statistic in the next fire. So some of the cool stuff we get to do, I get to talk to a lot of landowners, which is fantastic um, on the phone and in person, preferably uh, town meetings, those kind of things. There's great programs like the Firewise USA here. Um, so there's Firewise sites, and Firewise communities in Wisconsin. And then two of the local ones I'll, I'll just touch on here is uh, in the town of Seymour, just to the east of Eau Claire. Most of the town of Seymour is, or the whole town of Seymour is in a community wildfire protection plan. That's basically a partnership with uh, the fire department, the DNR, the town, uh, many of the landowners, emergency management and other county officials. Pre-planning for this and trying to get the word out in those communities about the fire risk. Um, so I think we've had a, a decent effect there for sure. And then in Rock Dam, which would be in Clark County or the town of Foster, there is a Firewise USA site. And also again, a community wildfire protection plan. And those are created based on fire risk. So if we have the correct soils, you know, that have the vegetation that's highly flammable and we got a lot of structures, you know, those are kind of a really bad combination. So if we get a fire on a bad day, it can it can crank through there really fast and have a lot of a lot of structures and feet people that you know lives are threatened. So in those areas, we try to do a lot of outreach, and these are just some of those examples of doing that. So a few realistic actions and things that I guess you guys as homeowners, cabin owners, visitors to these places, things you should be thinking about is you see in the picture here, essentially look at look at your home or your cabin. And again, don't just picture, I don't live in the woods. It's not uh, gonna affect me or I don't have to worry about it. Because again, a fire can come across basically any cover type and get to your structure. So looking around within five feet of there, try not to have anything flammable around your house. And then as you basically keep going out, there's a lot of firewise principles. Um, basically you can work on such as pruning up trees, um, having a cleared yard, Important thing, having an address number at the end of your driveway. So in an emergency, we can get to your house, whether it is for a heart attack or a stroke or a structure fire, or when you do need to evacuate people out of there. And then having a driveway that's accessible where we can back an engine or a tender or anything down that driveway safely and park it there and do some, some good, that's important. Uh, clearing a lot of that flammable brush. And then as you see in these pictures, cleaning out your gutters. Nobody likes doing that. But if you don't have basically gutter caps or covers, clearing that out is ultra important. And why you'll see it in the video here, but those embers and fire brands that are on the fires, those land in those spots, basically anywhere that snow goes, picture them like snowflakes. And if they land in the gutter, they get those leaves going from the leaves, the whole gutter starts on fire and then it crawls underneath your roof and pretty soon your house is on fire. So people have lost houses, when the fire wasn't even uh, close by. So the fire maybe was a half mile or a mile away and that house can still burn down from those fire brands landing in that. Other examples, make sure you have a good raked yard. Don't store firewood right up against your house. We recommend 30 feet or farther away. And then if you have a garden hose, you know, keep it on and keep it rolling. And you can see the Alpine fire. I just threw a nugget on here for myself, but I was on a fire about two weeks ago here, um, just south of Maryland, a landowner, uh, wildfire, I think it was maybe uh, 20, 20 to 30 acres burned through the woods and she had an ember shower and embers, uh, firebrands landing all over her house and her uh, right up against her house there and through her yard. And because they raked and they cleaned their gutters out, I equate that to the reason their house partially didn't burn down. Also, there's a little luck there and there's also some fire department action, but she was safe because of the action she took following these firewise principles and I encourage anyone that has interest in this, go to firewise.org, O-R-G, for more information. So without any further ado, I'm gonna play a video for you guys. I don't think anyone has seen this, but I think it really covers a lot of these principles and the things that you guys can do on your end to make a difference for yourself. Uncontrolled, 
extreme wildfires are inevitable. These are the conditions when wildland urban interface disasters occur. The hundreds to thousands of houses destroyed during the wildfire. Does that mean that the wildland urban interface disasters are inevitable as well? No. We have great opportunities as homeowners to prevent our houses from igniting during wildfires. Most of our perceptions are that these big wildfires are something we can't do anything about. They're overwhelming. If huge organizations can't control the wildfire, how is it that somehow I can do something to my house to keep it from burning down? It's not a matter of controlling the wildfire, it's a matter of changing those conditions of the house and its immediate surroundings. There's a lot that we can do to the little things to our house and its immediate surroundings in order to reduce the ignition potential of that house. I'm going to do an assessment on this house for its ignition vulnerabilities. The assessment is what all of us homeowners can do. Currently, we're not in fire season, but it's getting hot and it's getting dry. So this is a perfect time before the smoke's in the air to do this assessment. The great opportunity we have as homeowners is that we can do the little things around our house to keep our home from igniting. We can actually separate our house from the extreme wildfire. We don't have to rely on the control of the extreme wildfire in order to keep our house from burning down. Over the last 30 years, my colleagues and I have done research involving laboratory experiments, field experiments, and post-fire disaster assessments to, to quantify and qualify the relationship between a wildfire and a destroyed home. What we found is that the high intensity flames more than 100 feet away from the house are largely incapable of igniting the house directly. It's the little things that seem to be destroying the houses. The burning embers, the, we call them firebrands, lofted out of the high intensity wildfire to land in the community, sometimes directly on houses as well as the surroundings. It's not 100 foot flames, it's a pile of firebrands that would fit in the palm of our hand. So my colleagues and I designed a firebrand, an ember shower demonstration. We have a full-size house. It's got bark mulch and pine needles around the base. It's got pine needles in the rain gutters. It's got pine needles on the roof. We have an ember generator that then casts a brand blizzard at this house. In order for those firebrands to be effective in igniting the house, they either have to ignite the house directly or they have to ignite something around the house that then can spread to the house. The main factors determining this home's ignition potential are right here. The home's characteristics related to its immediate surroundings. For our assessment, our perspective changes to this house being one of fuel for the potential ignition. Look around your house and see where the litter, the leaves and the needles have piled up and visualize that that's going to be where firebrands begin to pile up and, and collect. So here we have pine needle litter right up next to the house. It's on the steps. It could ignite and start this wall and step area on fire. It also can ignite on this lathing, which is right up underneath the wood shingle siding, and ignite that. This doesn't burn with high intensities. It burns with low intensities, but it's extremely important. In fact, on this house, it easily 
could be the critical factor that leads to its total destruction. If this house had rain gutters, this litter would be in the rain gutters, potentially igniting and putting flame right up at the eave line, potentially igniting the roof and going into the attic. On this side of the house, what our attention should be on is this gable vent. It's the most exposed kind of vent. I noticed that it's got fine mesh screen, which certainly helps keep large firebrands from going into the attic and potentially igniting this house. One of the things we looked at were vents during the brand blizzard. The brands are directly impacting that vent opening. The burning brands can blow right into the attic and potentially ignite the material that's in the attic. The remedy is simple. All we have to do is use finer mesh screen to cover the openings. One of the important aspects that we demonstrated was that you don't have to have a metal roof in order to keep the house from igniting, from firebrand. What we showed was that any roof that doesn't ignite and spread fire can survive the brand blizzard. So as we previously demonstrated, composition shingle roofs with pine needles on them don't represent a significant ignition problem. But look here, we've got a wood-sided wall coming down to the top of the roof where this needle deposition, when it ignites, is going to put flame contact right on the side of the wood wall. This results in flame contact and high ignition potential resulting in the destruction of this house. The house includes more than just itself if there are outbuildings that are close enough to ignite and spread to the house. So maybe we have a shed or we've got a chicken coop which then can burn long enough to ignite the shed that's next to that which then ignites and burns sufficiently in order to ignite the house. So we need to be as concerned about the surroundings of our outbuildings and their condition as we do our house. I looked into landscaping, I looked into fireproof home building, I looked into fireproof uh, lawn furniture. I mean, I was going for everything that I could for the safest fire safety you could. And we had a checklist. No fire would stack next to the house. All of our lawn furniture was fire rated. I wanted to feel like if there was a fire, we had the absolute best chance possible of us and our house surviving. So some of the little things that begin to get a house during a, an extreme wildfire from the firebrands are, for example, something as simple as a broom being left out. Flammable deck furniture, where we've got flammable cushions on, on the furniture on the deck next to the house. The cushions ignite from the firebrands, they ignite the deck railing which is connected to the house. We put three foot of uh, rock siding all the way around up the house as well as in our landscaping three feet out of crushed rock. We talked to people all it took was one thing a fire firewood stacked in the wrong place or lawn furniture caught fire on their porch. One tiny little technique that wasn't followed. Well, knowledge is key. The more you know, the more you can increase your chances, and not always does that have to cost money, right? It's just knowledge. It's still a shock to go through a fire, but to come back and see your home, right, that's such, an, uh, such a good feeling. Flame contact on the house is a really bad idea. 
what we want to make sure of is that we don't get flame contact on the house. We don't have a fire burning across pine needle litter, for example, and making direct contact with the house. But that only takes five feet around the house in order to keep the flames away. Let's take a look at the surrounding area of the house. Adjacent to this wood wall, we've got these green shrubs. So the question is, are these green shrubs a big problem and do they have to be removed? Well, as long as we've got green foliage without dead material, we're pretty good. But if we take a look, we've got dead material in the canopy and we've got dead material deposited under the wood wall. What we want to do to keep the shrubs is to prune out all the dead material within the canopy as well as underneath in order to keep the wall and the shrubs from igniting. So we don't need to put out all the fires. We don't need to make sure that no fire occurs within the neighborhood. We do need to make sure that there isn't high intensity fire within 100 feet. And we want to make sure that surface fire doesn't come directly to the house and ignite it. We definitely can't have a flammable wood roof on our house. It's the most susceptible to firebrand ignitions. But there are many things that occur on a seasonal basis. Cleaning up the litter around the base of the house, out of the rain gutters, making sure that we've swept the deck of, of pine needle litter and leaves, and making sure that our firewood piles aren't on the deck, and making sure that we've cut the grass and, and not having things right up next to the house that can burn. We've just taken a look at this home, but it's obvious that every home and every property are going to be different. That's why it's very important for us to seek information so that we can find the vulnerabilities to ignition of our own homes. Remember, if your home doesn't ignite, it doesn't burn. You've got to act now to address these little things long before the fire ever starts. All right. So hopefully that, that video there gave you some really good background and pointers, you know, both on why and how it's important to protect your house and some of the oftentimes simple things you can do to make sure that it uh, with, can withstand a wildfire. Um, I have one last quick video I wanted to show you, maybe the most important one of them all, but um, so bring that up here. So again, the best time to plant a tree, you know, the old adage is last year. So basically the best time also, I look at it to protect your house from a wildfire was last year. So in essence, get on it and boy, get out and do it right now. We are in the middle of fire season. So if you can do a couple of those simple things, truly that may make the difference in saving or losing your house in a wildfire. So I wanted to get that across. The very last thing I wanted to show you was 27 years ago this week, um, anyone that's a local resident probably remembers this or is familiar, but it's known as the Augusta fire happened, uh, basically five, six miles south of Augusta here. Um, it was a, a tragic event. The firefighter Bob Wiskavich lost his life battling a wildfire. Um, I think this, this video was taken by a bystander, a neighbor that saw the fire cranking through the field, running through the field here and was just taking video of it since they were familiar with it and probably knew the people that were out there. Um, I appreciate the family lending this video out for training and it's really helped probably educate tens of thousands of people across this country, um, fire departments mainly, but also civilians as well. So, and I guess that's the one thing to think of. Again, firefighters don't, don't expect we can get to every house and save every house if we have a large fire. So the things you can do yourself ahead of time can help if we are there, especially our volunteer firefighters, I think of them often, um, but all of us are putting our lives on the line to try to, to evacuate, save people and houses. So things can be deadly. And I guess as you watch this video, if you haven't seen it before, just take that into account. At the tail end, from right to left on this video, the fire was started by a debris pile, burned through a, essentially a pasture, some abandoned fields. 
and then the actual fields that were farmed and then into the woods. On the very end of this, you're going to see some firefighters working on what we see is the left flank of the fire. The wind shifted and the flames went from a couple feet to about 15 to 20 foot in just seconds. And unfortunately, that firefighter was burned over. So hopefully it's a, a good educational tool. And even thinking about the folks that come and help you, this is why it's important to uh, prevent fires. I apologize to everyone. It's not uh, playing for whatever the reason here. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but I guess um, it's just a, a good example. Obviously, um, you know, folks can lose their lives out there battling fire. So also, if you get a chance, thank a volunteer firefighter for all that they do as well. So I guess with that, unfortunately, I can't show that. But uh, we got a few minutes here for any questions from you guys. Um, if I can help you or relayed to some resources here, let me know. So do you have any questions out there? I don't see any questions in the chat. All right. I'll give you just a minute here and see if there is. And if not, um, again, um, Judd Corrick here. I'm at the Augusta Ranger Station. Anyone that's close by with uh, COVID-19 right now, I can't chat too well with everyone, but if you do call, we can set something up and I'll be glad to chat with you on the phone or in the parking lot here. Um, and then also I can also get you just uh, information, however best suits your needs there um, to help you out, so. All right. And then I guess, since I just got a second, also if you, the DNR's website is uh, dnr.wi dot gov g o v and if anyone goes on there if you type in uh say the word burn permit wildfire fire risk any of those keywords in the top right there's a little uh search icon it'll bring you to a lot of the information here S stuff that i've covered a lot of it in more depth and then there is up to date up to the second fire maps basically you can see where there are wildfires in the state uh, what started them, the, the structures that were saved and lost, uh, a lot of information about firewise, prescribed burning, natural ecosystems, and additionally too, if anyone has an interest, has a property in uh, you know doing a forest walkthrough, we as DNR foresters do offer basically free walkthroughs with the landowners on their properties and uh, try to measure what your goals for your properties are, um, whether they're wildlife, timber, you know, protection of the soil resource, what have you. We'll certainly uh, see what you have and try to fine tune your goals and get you uh, some ways to enhance your property to to match and even exceed some of your goals. So happy to do that. So reach out if you do have a need for that. Otherwise, I'll ask Stacy. I guess one more time. Is there any questions? Uh, no, Jeff. There's All not right. any other questions. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you everybody for tuning in, and uh, we'll see. You.